Belize, Central America. In 1924, British adventurer Frederick Mitchell Hedges traveled here with his daughter Anna to explore the ruins of the ancient Mayan city of Lubantun. One afternoon, Anna climbed to the top of a crumbling pyramid, hoping to see the ocean. It was high noon and she was at the top and the way the sun came in, the way the rocks had moved in that there was just a small opening and the light from the sun went through and they hit the top of the skull. And she ran down and she's all excited. She said, there's someone in there with a flashlight. Anna's father and others in their party were too large to fit inside the small opening of the pyramid. So they tied a rope around Anna and lowered her into the hole. When she came back up, Anna held the top of a strange crystal skull. A second search uncovered a matching jaw. As you might have suspected, nothing you just heard is true. The real story about the Mitchell Hedges skull is quite different. It's worth mentioning that the reason that Ancient Aliens focuses in on the Mitchell Hedges skull is because all of the other known crystal skulls have now been proven to be fakes, and even Ancient Aliens admits this. Scientific tests have determined that the two owned by the British Museum and the Kate Branley were not authentic pre-Columbian artifacts. The Mitchell Hedges skull was the last hope for a real one, and the only reason it was the last hope was because the daughter of Mitchell Hedges, while she was still alive, refused to have an official study done to see if it was fake or not. Rather than that, she toured around with it in New Age conventions and the like until she recently died. Her widower, however, in 2007, took it to the Smithsonian Museum for Natural History, where extensive testing was done on it. It was found to be a fake, just like the others. I'm not sure if Ancient Aliens produced this episode before or after 2007, but I suspect that they wouldn't have cared much either way. The real history of the Mitchell Hedges skull starts with another crystal skull that was in the British Museum, which the forger of the Mitchell Hedges skull copied it from. The British Museum acquired a crystal skull in 1898, at a time right after tools were first invented that made it possible to carve crystal skulls like these. We now know it was also a time when a lot of fake crystal artifacts were sold to museums. The British Museum skull, which has its own dubious history, was later found to be fake too. But in the 1930s, it was still believed to be genuine, and it was proudly displayed in the museum. Based on research done on the Mitchell Hedges skull by the Smithsonian Museum, it was concluded that the forger of the Mitchell Hedges skull copied the one in the British Museum in order to make his work seem more authentic. The Mitchell Hedges skull was first owned by a man named Sidney Burney, who we have records of trying to sell it to various people unsuccessfully for 10 years before this. He finally sold it to a member of the general public at a Sotheby's auction in London in 1943. That member of the general public was Frederick Mitchell Hedges. We actually have the letter that Mitchell Hedges wrote to his brother directly after purchasing the skull at the auction, in which he expresses his excitement about his new purchase. This will be important later. Five years later, though, in a local paper, he was claiming that he found the skull himself in a daring expedition to Central America. Mitchell Hedges was a renowned storyteller and often sold his fanciful stories to Hearst newspapers. For example, Mitchell Hedges was a fisherman by trade, so he would have tales of him catching previously undiscovered animals, fighting off sea monsters, tales of man-eating sharks, as well as your average big fish stories. Later, though, with his book Danger is My Ally, he told tales of him discovering previously unknown lands and undiscovered people groups, as well as battling all kinds of jungle dangers. Later on, people would write editorials that had been to the areas that he said he went to and publicly debunked him. Mitchell Hedges was also shown to hoax an odd situation involving a supposed robbery and several shrunken heads. He even lost a very public libel suit concerning this. But all of this only scratches the surface of the deceit that surrounds the Mitchell Hedges skull. First of all, none of the stories about the discovery of the Mitchell Hedges skull match each other and all of them contradict the letter that he sent to his brother in 1943, which clearly says he bought it at an auction. It says, The collection grows and grows and grows. You possibly saw in the papers that I acquired that amazing crystal skull that was formerly in the Sidney Burney collection. 
It is fashioned from a single block of transparent rock crystal, exactly life-size. Scientists put the date at pre-1800 BC, and they estimate it took five generations, passing from father to son to complete. It is anthropologically perfect in every detail, a superb piece of craftsmanship. There is only one other in the world known like it, which is in the British Museum, and it is acknowledged to be not so fine as this. Many years later, when this letter surfaced, his adopted daughter Anna tried to explain the discrepancy between these stories this way on her website. Quote, in 1943, Mitchell Hedges got embroiled in another controversy that still rages in some quarters to this day. In times before burglar alarms, it was not unusual to leave valuable items with friends if one was going away for long periods of time. Mitchell Hedges did this with a school friend, Sidney Burney, who had always shown an interest in the crystal skull. However, in 1943, Burney inexplicably put the crystal skull up for auction at Sotheby's in London. Mitchell Hedges learned of this the day before and was so furious that for a while he was unable to speak. Unable to contact Bernie, he arose the next day at 5 a.m. and traveled to London to retrieve his property. Sotheby's informed him that the vendor was Sidney Bernie's son. When they refused to withdraw it from the sale, Mitchell Hedges realized the easiest way of regaining his property was to purchase it back. This he did for 400 pounds. This doesn't make sense for a lot of reasons let alone that according to her story, which we will get to in a minute, this would mean that he had the skull for 10 years and didn't mention it to anyone, until after he writes this letter to his brother a decade later, obviously implying that it was something that he just acquired for the first time. After Mitchell Hedges died, the skull was left to Anna Mitchell Hedges, his adopted daughter, and this is when things get really sketchy. Anna spent her entire life trying to sell the skull, she hired a guy named Frank Dorland, an art dealer, to promote the skull so that she could get it sold. Dorland had worked with her father when he was alive to sell another one of his objects, which also turned out to be a fake. She and Dorland signed an agreement in July of 1964 that he would promote the skull and that the price of its sale must be no less than $50,000. Dorland then got busy trying to make everything look really official including coming up with a totally different story for the skull's discovery. After this agreement with Dorland in 1964 was the first time that Anna claimed that it was she, not her father, who found the skull, something that no one else seemed to mention in the last 30 years. By doing this, it made Anna the sole person who could establish provenience for the skull, something that a buyer would want, especially a museum. And because everyone else involved was dead by this time, there was no one left to contradict this new story. All of the mystical claims about the skull were born out of the two books that the promoter, Frank Dorland, commissioned in order to promote the skull. Here is a letter from Dorland to Anna concerning the writer who he wanted to write one of the books. Quote, I have convinced Dick Garvin, who does sell, it is worth the percentage to you and me and you to furnish the information. This makes it a better book and makes more money all the way around. The skull is not sold. It is put to use in this manner and for public appearances to boost sales and interest. These books make outlandish claims about the crystal skull's origin and powers, and since the books were released at the height of the New Age movement, they enjoyed an uncritical and enthusiastic audience. During all these years, they tried desperately to sell the skull. The problem was that because of all the fakes, museums were now asking to validate the skull first. One letter from the British Museum to Anna shows that the negotiations were stopped when the curator caught wind of the actual history of the skull. None of this stops ancient aliens from promoting all kinds of contradictory stories about the skull. Yes, there are alien artifacts. Even uh, some people think they're made on another planet. But they were created specifically to hold records from alien civilizations. There's a legend that there were 13 skulls and that when the 13 skulls come together, then something significant will change in the world. Legend suggests that there are 12 additional worlds out there, planets which are inhabited by intelligent species. These 13 crystal skulls that are allegedly exist on planet Earth were each brought here from one of those 12 planets and the 13th skull 
is the one that apparently contains all of the information of all those 12 different worlds. And that's the legend of the Crystal Skulls. But as ancient astronaut theorists maintain, why would visiting aliens have given the Crystal Skull to the Maya? The only problem is that no one can seem to find a record of this Mayan prophecy. The idea seems to trace back to one New Age author. Mayan scholars have never heard of this legend, and certainly not this one. A lot of natives and a lot of people working with crystal skulls say that the high quartz content skulls, and especially the quartz skulls themselves, is the highest frequency or energy or vibration possible on the physical plane. And so a lot of native people kind of worshipped or took care of these objects because they knew that they had or felt that they had the highest energy possible on the earth plane. This whole myth was birthed out of a marketing campaign for a forged artifact, a myth which found a home in the New Age. In conclusion, all of the proposed crystal skulls have now been conclusively proven to be hoaxes. The last holdout, the Mitchell Hedges skull, was only still a candidate because it was not allowed to be examined until recently. Its history is full of greed and lies, and its genuineness could only be accepted by the most dedicated devotee given the facts we now know.